Hello everyone, this is George Cow. Hello, hello, hello. I'm joined here by Mango, one of my cats. Got two cats. This one is Mango. The other one you may have seen in another video, a gray one is Baby Girl. <laughs> anyway, um, he's been uh, he's been meowing to get up here, so I figured he wanted to join me for this little birthday hangout. And uh, speaking of birthday hangout, um, I can if I can figure this out, I will uh, make this a little bit more festive. Um, down, okay, here we go. Let's see, if, let's see if I can make this work here. Um, all right, there are some headgear I can put. There we go. <laughs> okay, or oh, here we go. Here's here's a more festive one. So. Um, Hello everyone. This is Whoa, hold on a second here. Uh, I'm hello. hearing myself uh, on the other video. Okay, all right. So uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to go and, and post in the comments thread, the chat, the chat place. So if you can join me on the video on the right-hand side, uh, it should say view all comments. And if you um, click on that, or uh, there should be a leave a comment on the right hand side. And you, if you click on that and type hello, then the that'll come through. So um, welcome to you again. And this is actually part of the whole monthly Q and A series. So what I want to do is to see if there are any questions um, during my monthly Q and A calls. We can talk about marketing. We talk about um, productivity. We talk about basically how do we create a life of um, the deepest joy, which encompasses, uh, which is infused into our work and into our business, into our marketing as well. So, uh, welcome to you again. I'm getting a little distracted by this hat on my head. So, uh, what I'm going to do is um, remove it for now, and I'll, I'll, I can put it back later. But I'll remove it for now. <laughs> I know it's kind of boring, boring hair now, right? Uh, so let me just take a quick look to see if any of you are chatting away. Hello, thank you Loretta and Tomar and Terry for chatting there. I appreciate your presence. Um, thank you for joining me on my birthday here. Uh, my birthday was actually yesterday and um, I, uh, you know, it was perfect. It was, it was the weekend, right? So um, on Saturday um, we went to, me, my wife and I went to the Green Festival, which is the largest as far as I know, the largest sort of green trade show, sustainability, social justice, that kind of thing, um, creating a whole new economy of, with more compassion and more uh, uh, thoughtfulness about the earth. Um, and there were, I think, hundreds of vendors there, all kinds of companies and organizations that are working on the new economy, uh, the economy, again, that's green, and that's sustainable, and that's uh, for a better world. And that was so inspiring. And I, I encourage all of you to go check it out. It's greenfestivals.org. Be sure to put an S at the end of festivals. So greenfestivals.org. And you can just go check out what they're up to. Uh, you can look at all the vendors there and just get inspired by all the companies that are uh, creating and helping to create a new economy. Um, also, one at, looking at the comments thread, thank you, Annie for joining me. Thank you. Um, there's Annie Lynn and there's also Annie Pat Hopkins. Thank you both. Betsy, thank you for joining me as well. Uh, I, I mentioned thank you uh, Tomar and um, Loretta and Terry is there also. And I know that some of you may be chatting away on the Google Plus page. You know, we are all getting used to this um, going back and forth between Google Plus and the YouTube on these Hangouts, those of you who are live with me anyway. Um, but uh, in fact, I, somehow I can't pull up that Google Plus page. So if it's uh, if you see other people on the Google Plus page chatting away and they're not seeing they're not seeing the video, please go ahead and send them the link. Post the link again on the Google Plus page if you like. All right. So um, oh, thank you also, Richard. Uh, for joining, for joining me here, and Richard was at the Green Festival on Sunday. I was there on Saturday. Um, on Sunday, what did we do? Sunday, Sunday, we went for a, a, a little walk in the park and went to see a movie, and it was nice. Um, so I kind of had an active weekend, and I'm feeling a little bit tired today. But anyway, really energized and happy to be with you. Um, one of the things I, I I got together with a couple of friends um, this weekend. And one of them gave me a little birthday gift I wanted to show you. Um, 
speaking of birthday, I'll I'll put my I'll put my I'll, I put my funny hat back on again. Those of you who haven't seen it, um, let's see here. There we go. All right. <laughs> so, um, book that was given to me called "Be Fearless." Hopefully, you can see this. "Be Fearless," and it's uh, little quotes by a man uh, by by an Indian guru that they they really um, respected. And there's a lot of wonderful little quotes in here, um, but I'll maybe I'll, I can read a couple of them and. Um, Interesting quotes. Okay, um, one of them says, "When all, when all again, again, this is from the book um, Be Fearless, a little tiny little book. When all the desires of the heart will be vanquished, then the very man will become God." Interesting. When all the desires of the heart will be vanquished, and the very so is the idea of becoming empty of our um, of our ego and letting life just flow through us. I think um, another one I love. It says. In this world, always take the position of the giver. In this world, always take the position of the giver. Love that. Um, and by the way, as I'm as I'm speaking here, I encourage you. As this is part of the monthly Q and A call series, and the Pope birthday celebration was just a little part of it. Um, and and I'll, I'll share with you uh, later as we have um, as we have time. I'll share with you maybe some some birthday thoughts, but. Um, Please feel free to post any questions that you have, and the questions can be about you know marketing or true livelihood or productivity that kind of thing. I see in the comments thread um, Donna is also here with us. Thank you, Donna and Christy. Thank you for joining me as well. And Kay is here also. Thank you so much. And I know I've said hello to all the rest of you, and thank you so much. Those of you who haven't yet joined us in the comments thread, if you're watching the video on YouTube. Uh, if you're watching it live, you can actually post a comment on the right-hand side. I hope I'm pointing the right way. The right-hand side of the video. And if you are watching this as a replay, the comments thread is um, below the video. Okay. Uh, some more little quotes um, from the book Be Fearless. Man and woman has infinite power within himself, and he can realize it. Amen. And I just wanted uh, just a quick uh, note about who this guru is. Um, I think his name is Vivek Kananda. I actually can't even see his name, and his name isn't even in here. It's the weirdest thing. But uh, the, my friend told me the story of how when he came to the states, this Indian guru, um, he went to the World Religions Conference, and he wasn't even planning to be a speaker there, but. Somehow someone asked him to show up, and someone asked him to be in, in, in the front just to say a few words. And there, that's what he did. He just said, I think, a sen I think one sentence is what he said, and he got a seven-minute standing ovation for just saying one sentence. And um, what's important is not really what he said, but really it was the, the presence that he had. Um, that made everyone stand up and, and, and gave him a standing ovation. So it's something about how when we are fearless, when we are um, deeply connected with the divine within ourselves, um, when we are living the life we're meant to live in purpose, uh, the, the presence that we have um, can be palpably felt by others. And... Um, um, a couple more quotes. He who even while doing action can keep his mind calm is the perfect worker. So that's a, that's a wonderful um, tribute to joyful productivity, maybe. <laughs> um, and let's see here, another one. Take up one idea. Make that idea your life. Think of it. Dream of it. Live on that idea. And so um, what, what I'm going to do, I guess I'll, I'll share with you briefly um, some birthday thoughts. And I guess uh, the birthday thought that comes to me is uh, I have been uh, reciting, and um, let me just kind of take off the birthday hat for a moment here. I have been reciting three truths every day now for 
um, probably a couple of months now, and uh, I recite these truths every day, uh, just you know, at least once a day. But it kind of comes to me naturally now. I'm going to share with you what those three truths are, and I want to invite you to post in the comments thread if there is one or several truths that you recite to yourself on a regular basis, whether that's daily or weekly. Hopefully, that's that would be regular. If it's once a month, it's not so regular. But if it's weekly or daily, there's or more than once a day, if there's a, a truth or several truths that you recite to yourself. I welcome you to share that in the comments thread, and then that'll hopefully um, be an inspirational to all of us. Um, so the the first truth is that I, and when I say I, I also look around me and say you, because I believe that spirits are around us all the time, I mean, literally. The spirits of the dead, or the spirits of the not yet born, or the spirits of those who are never going to be born, uh, are with us, around us, um, all the time. And um, there are spirits that are good, uh, that are want us to to have the longest term good possible, and there are spirits that are addicted to various um, negative thoughts that are also surrounding us. And what I say is basically, I and you, all around, are individually known, we are individually loved, we are individually protected, guided, supported, forever and ever safe um, beyond our wildest imagination. So that's the first truth that I, that I share. You and I are forever loved, individually known, individually prayed for, individually supported, individually guided, far deeper and greater uh, than even what we know right now, than what I can say. So that's the first truth that I recite to myself every day. The second truth I recite to myself is everything that I truly need, I will always have. Another way I say that is everything that I truly need, anything that I truly need, I either already have or I will have for sure. And that, of course, comes on to the, uh, as, as a part of the foundation of the first, it comes on the foundation of the first truth, which is that you and I are perfectly safe forever, now, today, tomorrow, forever. Um, and the third truth that I like to recite is every moment of virtue, by virtue I mean unconditional giving, unconditional loving, discipline, uh, diligence, focus, um, kindness, humility, whatever virtue means to you, compassion, every moment of virtue, even if it is not seen, has ripple effects that are far beyond the visible realm. Has ripple effects in the visible realm and far beyond the visible realm. Every moment of virtue. So those are three truths that I recite to myself and have been for a couple of months now and they've had a profound, they've been making a profound difference in my life. Um, Again, back to the book, Be Fearless. The question that I sometimes wonder is, how can we be fearless? How can we be fearless? And the answer that comes to me is, I can be fearless when I know that I'm eternally safe, that there's nothing to fear. Right? If I am eternally safe, and if there's nothing to fear, then of course I can act fearlessly. And secondly, if I know that everything I truly need, I will always have, then I can act fearlessly. Right? Everything I truly need, I will always have. It doesn't matter, you know, I don't have to be perfect in my planning of my finances or perfect in my scheduling my time and life or whatever. I don't have to be sure that if I give something to someone, they're going to give something back to me. Everything I truly need, truly need, right? There are things that I might want that it's my sort of short-term self wants, okay? But it's not what I truly need for the longest term possible. Um, everything I truly need, I will always have. And thirdly, every moment of virtue 
has ripple effects that are far beyond the visible realm, then I can be fearless in every moment because I'm safe. I know, I know everything I need I'll always have, and I know that if I'm fearless, even if no one sees it, it makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. So think about that, and, and um, uh, you can maybe integrate some of those ideas into any truth that you, that you live personally and that you recite. Um, let me take a quick look at the comments thread now and all the wonderful comments that are coming through. Thank you, Denise, Annie, Pat. Thank you, Tomar and Allison. Thank you, Axel and uh, Donna, Terry, um, Richard. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, and Richard had a question about how come we are watching this live. I know the, there's a live version, obviously, some of you are here, and there's a replay version on YouTube. Um, but the live version we're also watching on YouTube. Um, and the question is whether or not the YouTubes and the Hangouts are connected. The Hangouts and YouTube, uh, Hangouts on Air and YouTube are actually becoming more and more connected. They're actually rolling out a greater integration in the next couple of weeks, and so um, you will see it become more and more connected. The reason why I like to uh, have us watch this on YouTube and comment is because the, if you post a comment on the YouTube version, the comments will be kept for the people who watch the YouTube video later. Whereas if you comment only on the Hangouts um, version, uh, the Hangouts will only be staying with the event, the Hangout event, which is old. When you people go to the replay later on the Hangouts, it says an old date and it has this feeling of it's already been passed. Whereas the YouTube, everyone's used to watching YouTube videos and YouTube always seems current. Um, so that's why I, I prefer the comments be on the YouTube. So I hope that explains. But but anyway, the Hangouts on Air, Google and uh, Google Hangouts and and YouTube are going to get more and more integrated in the coming weeks. So that later there's not going to be this disconnect anymore. It's all going to be in one place. Um, that comments will be in one place. So just uh, just just so you know. Okay. Now um, feel free to keep on posting your questions and of course your comments. And uh, thank you so much for your comments so much. I, I appreciate them so much. I'm reading them just very briefly. <laughs> thank you, Betsy and Tomar and Denise and uh, Annie Pat and all those who are commenting here. So, um, yeah, the questions are coming through. You know, how can we be fearless? And I invite you to answer that question yourself. How can we be fearless? And... Um, Denise wrote, you know, another truth for me is all manner of things will be well. All manner of things will be well. From Julian of Norwich. You know, it's interesting, Denise, that you mentioned Julian of Norwich. Um, and those of you who don't know, uh, Julian of Norwich is the saint who had popularized the... Um, the it's a, she, uh, she was a Christian mystic who popularized the... Um, the, 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 the the quote, you know, all, all shall be well, all shall be well, all manner of things shall be well. And I um, read her Wikipedia entry, uh, Wikipedia entry at some time ago, and I saw a, a passage from there that I wanted to share with you, actually. Um, let's see here. She shared, um, so this is from the Julian of Norwich Wikipedia entry, uh, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, her views were not typical, by the way, of, 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 of the church. And um, let's see here. So Ju Julian believed that sin was necessary because it brings someone to self-knowledge, which leads to acceptance of the role of God in their life. She taught that humans sin because they are ignorant or naive, not because they are evil. The reason commonly given by the medieval church to explain sin was that they were evil, that she believed that they, they sinned because they were ignorant or naive. Julian also believed that in order to learn, we must fail. So, so Julian was the first entrepreneur, right? <laughs> Julian believed that in order to learn, we must fail, and in order to fail, we must sin. She also believed that the pain caused by sin is an early rem earthly reminder of the pain of the passion of Christ, 
and that as people suffer as Christ did, they will become closer to him by their experiences. Isn't that interesting? Very unlike what the church thought in those days. Furthermore, this is from the Julian Norwich Wikipedia article, which, which um, I found interesting. Julian also saw no wrath in God. She believed wrath existed in humans, but that God forgives us for this. She wrote, for I saw no wrath except on man's side, and he, and he, meaning God, forgives that in us. For wrath is nothing else but a perversity and an opposition to peace and to love. Julian believed that it was inaccurate to speak of God's granting forgiveness for sins, because, God's, because forgiving would mean that committing the sin was wrong. She preached that sin should be seen as a part of the learning process of life. Again, Julian being the first entrepreneur, right? <laughs> Not a malice that needs forgiveness. She wrote that God sees us as perfect and waits for the day when human souls mature so that evil and sin will no longer hinder us. Now, isn't that interesting? Um, anyway, um, Julian's belief in God as mother was controversial, blah, blah, blah. It might be interesting for you to read, the, those of you interested in this kind of stuff, read the Julian Norwich Wikipedia article. Anyway, that was brought on by what Denise wrote in, um, in, in the comments thread there. Um, okay. So I am also looking at some, other, some of the other comments. Don, Donna mentioned, you know, George, about some kind of church. Um, uh, I, you know, a funny thing was I, I've been saying to myself and facetiously to my audience occasionally for some time that I probably should just go become a minister because I have always, um, when I was in college, I was leading music for some churches. So enjoyed that. People came up to me afterwards and said, George, you have a gift. You should use it. This, um, You're able to connect us to a divine presence. Um, I've always been so passionate about spiritual you know, spiritual living. And um, so thank you, <laughs> Donna, for acknowledging that. I, I feel like what I've been trying to do the past couple of years is bring spirituality more and more into business. Um, there's a lot of people online that do so-called conscious business, conscious marketing, and I commend them for that. The very least they can do is, is talk the talk, right? But I feel like con conscious business and conscious marketing doesn't have enough spirituality infused into it, or the spirituality uh, is so, so, so much of the spirituality is so um, self-indulgent, in my opinion. Um, uh, it's so focused on, you know, I, I want to share with you a, uh, another profound uh, change idea that I realized recently, which is where do we source our joy? And I want you to think about this. Where do you get your joy? Where do you get your joy? Um, the idea of enjoyment, right, the idea of passion even in work. A lot of us, uh, in fact, I've said this myself, that passion in work means doing work that doesn't feel like work, right? And there's some truth there, but I also realize that this, this, this idea can be misleading because when, why, when, when I've been talking about true livelihood and passion in work, this, this, there's this idea that we should do work that has no pain, or do work that has no frustration, do work that has no hardship involved, do work that has no suffering, that everything should be enjoyment and pleasure, right? And I feel like there has been a really profound disconnect and um, I should say a, 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 a wrong connection between pleasure, physical pleasure on the one hand, and joy. Um, uh, and, and even this relates also to desire, right? There's physical desire and then there's sort of more spiritual desire. And people kind of conflate the two and say, desire, oh, desire, all desire is good. Desire is your, 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 the God within you wanting to do something. Well, does that mean I, I have a desire to eat as much chocolate as I can, as eat as much pop, you know, popcorn as I can? I had that desire yesterday at the movies, and so I gorged out on it. I didn't feel very good afterwards. So was that the God within and the desire, right? There was a lot of joy in eating the popcorn. <laughs> but afterwards, um, I realized I should have stopped at some point, and I... Actually, I, I, I shouldn't say, I actually did stop. I was pretty good at moderating myself yesterday. But most times when I go to the movies, I, I don't. You know, I, 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 do it, I overdo it. So, so this idea of joy, I realized the question that I gave myself was how, how, how sensitive am I to joy? 
where am I sensitive to joy? Because a lot of us, most of us in modern society, we are so distracted by the possibility, the possibility of pleasure around. There's so much pleasure that's possible around us, physical pleasure. You know, whether it's in food or whether it's in internet, um, whether it's in you know comforts that we have around. There's so much pleasure, whether it's entertainment, and yet. I think a lot of that pleasure has dulled us, D-U-L-L-E-D, dulled us to a deeper joy that happens, that we also sense, but we kind of forget and forget how to, how to really be sensitive to that. And the deeper joy you have experienced in daily life, deeper joy in the giving. When you give, you sense this deeper joy. Uh, when, you, when you find yourself being useful to other people, you sense this deeper joy. Right. Um, when you accomplish something, you sense a deeper joy. When you overcome an obstacle, when you um, did something that you know you should do, but it was painful, but you did it anyway, and you accomplished it, you sense this deeper joy. And um, I in invite us and encourage us to be more and more sensitive to that joy. I've been trying to become more sensitive to that, to become sensitive to that, because otherwise, we are overly gorged, our senses, right, sensitive, our senses are gorged on the material comforts of life. Um, I, I've been reading in a couple of, I, I can't remember where this comes from, but a, a couple of sources of spiritual texts that I read recently about, are about how there are challenges in, in being wealthy and there are challenges in being poor. And by poor, the spiritual texts weren't talking about those of us living in modern society, and you know we, um, you know, we, we're not poor here in modern society. By poor, they meant you know people who are starving poor. There are challenges in both being poor and being wealthy, but the challenges in being wealthy are greater. Isn't that interesting? I, I read this in a, at least a couple, at least two spiritual texts. I read this in two separate schools of thought, two separate religions. The challenges of being wealthy and being poor are both great, but the challenges of being wealthy are greater. And what I what I got from that was, oh my God, we are gorged in the sense our senses, the sensitivity we have to joy is so challenged because we conflate the earthly joys that we get every single day, which is not a bad thing, but we're gorged on that. And it's hard to become sensitive to the more subtle joys, subtle. Think about subtle, right? Subtle energies. The more sensitive to the more subtle joys that are also within us. Um, the joys that are more gentle, actually. The joys of virtue. Um, and why am I saying all this? And how does it relate to true livelihood? I think the way it relates is that when we become more and more gently, subtly sensitive, I should say sensitive to the subtle and gentle joys, of virtue, we realize that so much of our work can have that joy even when we're doing things that externally seem tedious. Because true livelihood or passion and career requires a lot of hard work. Um, every, every time I listen to a successful business person, an interview with a successful business person, there's always a lot of hard work that came with it. Um, successful people have this ability to be okay with discomfort. Now, this is interesting, right? Oh, I, by the way, I, I uh, invite you to Google. Um, there's an article by Zen Habits called Why the Fear of Discomfort Might Be Ruining Your Life. So just Google that. I, I don't know. Um, uh, Google Zen Habits. Fear of discomfort. Zen habits. Fear of discomfort. Just Google that and read the read the article. It's pretty short, profound. It's this idea that in modern life we have so many things that can make us comfortable. Um, the internet is is another one of those that we have become more and more fearful of discomfort, right? More and more fearful of discomfort. In fact, I feel like there's a whole perhaps a whole um, a whole generation of children that are growing up that are continually connected to the internet. Um, it's, it's like comfort food, right? Being connected to the internet is like comfort food. So many things to enjoy online. We become so fearful of discomfort that 
it's hard for us to do the hard things. And to be successful in business, I've never heard a, success, a successful business person say, oh, I just did everything that was just fun and enjoyable. Everything was fun. When I do hear people say that, I think what they mean by fun is they're actually talking about that subtler joy, that, a virtue that I was talking about earlier, a subtler joy virtue. Giving is fun. You know, giving is, giving is a more obvious fun, uh, obvious spiritual fun, because you can see in return quickly, usually, when you give and then you, you, someone appreciates you, that's a very, very quick feedback loop. And um, it's less subtle in terms of the, the spiritual joy. But anyway, doing hard work is spiritually joyful, um, but it's not externally joyful. And in being in discomfort, as we do the, the, the work that's required for our livelihood, is actually spiritually joyful, but it's not externally joyful. And so um, as we become more sensitive to the subtle joys of virtue and doing the hard work necessary for our livelihood, for our true livelihood, um, the more we're able to do that hard work, and by hard work I don't mean manual labor because most of our true livelihood these days has something to do with the internet. By hard work I mean the uncertainty that that is facing us every day in our true livelihood and being willing to sit with the uncertainty and continuing to structure, structure, structure even in the uncertain. That's one way of hard work, right? Writers know this very well. When you're writing, um, there's uncertainty about what the, what the piece will become. But the willingness to sit with that uncertainty and then let the structuring of information come through you and doing the hard work of thinking. Thinking is the hard work that, that really uh, besets most of us these days. Um, yeah, thinking is hard work. Thinking is structuring information, being willing to um, sit with some body of work or some random pieces of data and seeing, st sit with it long enough to start seeing patterns. You know, that reminds me of Einstein. Einstein, who said, you know, there's nothing special about me. I'm just, in, in, I'm just passionately curious. And I think Einstein was so curious, so passionate about particular subjects, he was willing to sit with the discomfort, the hard work of looking at those random data and sit, sitting with it long enough, trying to piece this together in this way and trying to piece that together in that way and finally that came through. So I, I, I speak of all this just to inspire you. Think about how you can experiment with sitting with discomfort in your true livelihood. What does, 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 what does the discomfort mean to you? In your true livelihood, how can you sit with that? Some of, for some of us, that's technology, right? Um, discomfort with technology, meaning, oh my God, I tried this, it didn't work. How can I try this differently, right? Discomfort um, means trying something and having it not work. Failure is, is not comfortable externally, but guess what? We can sense into the spiritual joy of the fact that we are, we have a great work ethic, right? Sense into the spiritual joy that you know we're not quitting. The not quitting, there's a great spiritual joy to it. Okay, I'm not going to quit, even though this technology thing didn't work, and I'm going to try something else. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Google it. And you know, one of the things I wanted to do today was actually do some Googling with you guys to show you that anything you want to learn about technology can be learned for free online. I, I actually um, haven't bought any kind of business training or technology training for at least two years now. Uh, in the last two years, everything I've needed to learn about business or technology, I haven't paid for any information. The, the only exception is some books I've paid for. Everything else I've learned by Googling it. And so I really hope that whether it's technology challenges or whether it's business challenges or whether it's idea challenges or whatever it is that you have in your true livelihood, that you be willing to sit with discomfort. Be willing to sit with discomfort, ask for help, pray for help, be willing to sit with discomfort and keep trying different things, which is still uncomfortable because there's uncertainty. Right? The, the discomfort comes from the uncertainty that whether something will work. So be willing to sit with the discomfort. Be willing to be sit with the uncertainty because hopefully you're reciting some truths in your life, such things as I'm eternally safe. I'm always safe. Everything I truly need, I'll always have. So knowing that, I'm actually okay with discomfort. When I remember that, I'm okay with discomfort for this moment.
right? To sit with that, to try, keep trying new things. Google, Google search, whatever question you have. You, you're Googling search, if you Google search, that's, that's another uh, discomfort we have in daily life, right? We search on Google, we can't find the results in the first page and we get uncomfortable. <laughs> no, sit with that discomfort, sit with that uncertainty whether you'll ever find the results on, results on Google. Keep asking the question in a different way. For, ask Google uh, the question in a different way, and you'll almost always find the result. That, that's what I found in a way. Okay, so um, uh, let me now go back to the comments thread, and what I'm going to do is uh, if you – I love the comments that are happening because you all are kind of talking with each other. Uh, whenever the comments uh, thread is actually working, <laughs> you're actually talking with each other. So I, I really love seeing that. Tomar and Christy and Grace, um, thank you all for commenting there and talking with each other. And Betsy and Donna, um, Annie, Pat, and uh, Denise, uh, Allison, uh, thank you all. T uh, Terry. Um, okay, so. Uh, let me now invite you to post any questions, and um, if you want to, uh, for me anyway, or questions for one another, you can always uh, type the word question in the, in the, right before your question. So you type the word question, and then go ahead and ask your question. The question can be about anything. In fact, you know, here's what I want to go, go get into here. Uh, we have about, uh, 20, about 20 minutes left, and what I want to do is do some screen sharing with you. And the screen sharing I want to do is actually Googling. So I, I want to show you how I discover answers. And if I can empower you, I mean, think about this. If I can empower you to discover all the answers you need for business, for technology, uh, for marketing, um, yes, you might say I'm working myself out of a job, but. I feel like the best doctors, the best healers, the best consultants, um, I shouldn't say the best, I should say the most virtuous ones, do their best to work themselves out of a job, um, to empower the people, if it's possible. I mean, some healing, some consulting is impossible to actually empower the people to do the thing. But what I want to do is work myself out of a job, okay, with you anyway. I want to empower you to do the things that you have been previously asking me, oh, George, how do I do this? I want to empower you, give you the skill to, to, to get all the answers yourself so that you actually don't need uh, for, from now on to buy any more information. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, you might still buy coaching in terms of accountability and uh, that kind of support, but um, all information that you need is actually available, uh, freely available. Um, uh, and Tomar says, yeah, ask Google the question and you can't find it there, ask your friends. So, um, I'm loving all the comments and I'm just kind of seeing all the comments here. Um, and part of the reason why I have decided uh, really from now on, or from at least a month ago, to start giving away all my information for free. So I'm going to start blogging for free, doing you know, these, of course, these chats. I'm not going to hold anything back anymore. In the past, I used to be taught and I used to teach the same thing that, oh, uh, I'm just going to teach you some of the juicier things that will make you want to buy for more information from me. You know, of course, and by the way, that works really well for sales. So just so you know, that works really well for making money. Um, I haven't figured out, uh, I haven't really figured out a business model yet for compassionate marketing, but I know I will. I have faith in it. Um, I know I will. I, I shouldn't say I haven't figured out a, a business model because lots of other people have. Bloggers who blog their life away for free and all the information they blog away for free. And they build enough of an audience where they then can sell advertising. That's one business model. Another business model is they might sell their time. You know, I, I'll, I can sell my time. You know, um, I'll give away all the information away for free. People can pay an hourly for my time to whatever. I mean, they want some clarification that somehow I can't do by blogging or whatever, I'd be happy to, to clarify or accountability, that kind of stuff. So that's another business model. Um, another business model, of course, is um, like people like Seth Godin, you know, they blog, they blog away all their information for free, but then occasionally they will curate, right, curate. Um, they charge for the curation. So they curate all the best blog posts they've had 
out of their hundreds of blog posts, they'll curate the blog posts uh, on a particular topic and then sell the book. So that's another business model because selling books. Now, I, I want to share something interesting. I, I had a realization. Why do we feel selling is icky in some circumstances? Now, there's, of course, pressure, right? There's pressure in selling, and that feels icky. But I, I had a... I had a, um, sort of this idea come to me. I'm like, oh, yeah, I never really thought of that way. Selling feels icky to us when the context is not what we expect. When the context or the method are not what we expect. So let me, let's unpack that a little bit, and you can, this will hopefully be useful for you. When we go to the supermarket and when we buy an apple at the supermarket, okay, we buy an apple at the supermarket, it's very normal. It, it, we don't feel that, oh my god, the supermarket's trying to sell me an apple. How weird is that? No, we just buy an, an apple and then we check out. We don't, we don't go to the, the checkout stand and go, the checkout counter and go, it's so weird that this person wants to take my cash. It's so, so icky. Like, they're such a used car salesman. No, they, it's, there's a, the context and the expectation and the methodology is already within society's consciousness. And so we don't feel it's icky that a market is trying to sell us an apple. All right, we'll buy an apple. All right, we'll check out. It's, a, you know, it's all good. Um, now, it might feel icky to us. Now, part of the context is the price, right? So we see these apples, you know, a dollar a pound, two dollars a pound, and then suddenly there's an apple um, branded as some, you know, the George Cow apple is fifty dollars a pound. We'll go, oh my. God, that's icky. That's terrible. Why would someone sell apples for fifty dollars a pound just because they branded on it? So the context, the pricing is part of the context. It's not within expectation. And so sometimes people go, you know, for oh, so so what's out of context for an apple? So if I went, if I had an apple, right, and I was out for dinner with friends, and I go, hey, friends, uh, can I uh, this? I have an apple here. Can I sell this apple to you for five dollars or for a dollar? Buying an apple for a dollar is not, not a big deal. The price is not out of context here, but the, the situation is out of context. My friends would go, George, you're so weird. Why are you trying to sell me an apple? Same thing now with why do we sometimes feel icky that we're selling life coaching? Sometimes, you know, Really, I mean, for those of us who are selling life coaching or selling healing or selling whatever, that's, society, that's not yet within society's consciousness to buy because life coaching, right? People go, why are you? You're selling me friendship. Like I can go talk with my friends about my goals and whatever. Why are you trying to sell me life coaching? Now, of course, life coaching is now very normal. I mean, life coaching, as of a couple years ago, has been put into the dictionary. So you can see life coaching. I, you, we might say this: the people who sold life coaching years ago, they were pioneers for us. They got. They were courageous enough to get over the icky feeling and make people you know, feel icky and selling it. But they kept trying to sell it in different ways until it didn't feel icky anymore. And for us now, selling life coaching in certain contexts is no longer icky. You see? But selling life coaching is life coaching is still so new that there's only certain contexts where it doesn't feel icky. I don't know what those contexts are. I've never bought life coaching myself, actually. You know, funny thing. I've never I've never had a life coach. I've never bought life coaching. Maybe that tells me why. Uh, okay, selling online. So if you stumble upon a blog that has a wonderful advice and then this person is selling their time as a life coach, that no longer feels icky to us, you see. So it's all about context. But if you're on a webinar, so uh, another example where some of us feel icky. We're on a webinar and then we're sharing all this great information and then suddenly, or we're, we're hearing all this great information and suddenly the person comes through with an offer that maybe is not really connected with the webinar, which is why in the webinar method I teach you to make sure the content is connected to your offer, strategically connected to your offer, but they make an offer that somehow feels a disconnect. That's why it feels icky to us, because the context is not right for the marketing of it. The context, has, the context and the expectations haven't been set. And so some webinar people try to overcome this by even in the beginning saying, okay, so for example, even the marketing of the webinar they say, all right, this webinar is a preview call, right? Oh, this is a preview call for the XYZ program launch. So they immediately set the expectation that there's going to be an offer. So when the offer comes through, it feels a lot less icky because the expectations and the context was already there. 
So you might think about this. Think about how in your marketing and your selling, how can you set the context more for what your offer is? So, um, so and that example is a good one, right? When you give, for, give away free information, in the very beginning of your free information, if you want to sell more information, say, all right, this is a sample of the book. This is a sample of the course. This webinar is a sample of the program that's coming up. That's not only more honest, but it feels less icky when you're actually making the offer, right? So the context is there. But it takes courage. It takes courage, like, oh my God, but if I say that this is a sample, fewer people are going to consume this free thing because in the past, what we usually do is trick them, bait and switch. We say this is all free, and then we bait and switch with an offer later. And I regret that. I regret teaching. If I have taught, of course, I've taught that in the past. I regret teaching the bait and switch method. So I'm coming more and more to seeing how can we, how can we set the context for the offer, right? How can we set context for the offer as early on as possible so that the expectation is there? When you walk into a market, you don't go, okay, I'm expecting that most of the stuff here is free, and then, the, and how come some, suddenly there's this apple that's being sold? Oh my God, no. <laughs> you walk into a store, you expect everything's going to be on sale there. And then, in fact, you are delighted when there's some free food being offered at the store, right? So it's kind of the context is, is very different. So, um, okay. All right. So let me just kind of scroll down. And, oh, Mira, thank you for joining us as well, and thank you for the birthday wishes. So let me kind of scroll down and see if there are any questions. And there's a, some great conversation happening in the comments thread. Those of you watching the video, check out the comments thread. Wonderful conversations happening there. Um, okay, so, um, okay, great. Donna has a question. If you posted a question, um, and, oh, by the way, Terry says, how do you support yourself if you give away everything for free? So this is important. Um, uh, hopefully I just addressed some business models that, that are working, right? Um, bloggers, for example, who give away all the free information. And, and here's the key. It's not, let's stop saying giving everything away for free. Just because we're giving all information for free isn't, we're not, I'm not giving my time for free. I'm giving some time for free, but not all of my time for free, right? So it's about time management, right? If you, if you are giving both all information and all time and all your very stuff, people, you open your front door and say, come in, take whatever you want, okay? Then you're giving away everything for free. Um, but we're not giving everything away for free, so let's make sure we use the language correctly because, of course, people say, well, how can you give everything away for free? No, we're not giving everything away for free. We're giving away the things that can be given away for free. Okay, we're giving away the things that can be. So uh, the way I think about it is I give away everything for free that is infinitely scalable. So if I post some information, I post it on Google or I post it on YouTube, I am not paying. If I post on Google Plus or on Facebook or on YouTube or on Medium.com, Medium.com is where I'm, I'm blogging nowadays. So you can find me at Medium.com slash at symbol George Cow. You can find me on GeorgeCow.com. Go to my blog from there too. But there are these websites that are you don't have to pay anything for it and you can just post information for free and infinite numbers of people can go to that website and get the information and it doesn't cost you a dime to publish it, right? So that's an, in, uh, that's an example of infinite scalability. YouTube is another example of infinite I can do this video. I can, of course, I can charge you each $2 to watch this video, but... I can also have a million, 10 million, a billion people watch this video and it doesn't cost me a dime. In fact, once, if a million people start watching this video, maybe I'll start you know, allowing advertising to be placed on these videos and, and kind of earn money from that. So think about giving away that which can be given for free and I'm, I'm encouraging you to do this because of the whole compassionate marketing model. But the things that are truly scarce becomes a business model. Okay, and I'm not the first person to say this. Of course not. If you look at uh, if you look at the book, there's a book called uh, by Chris Anderson. Chris Anderson is the guy who started TED Talks, TED Talks, and Wired magazine. He wrote a book called Free, F R E E. That's that's what he basically said. Give away that which is infinitely scalable, and then that which is not scalable, you charge for it. Your time is not infinitely scalable. Um, giving a speech 
is not uh, an in-person speech, I should say. You can't cram a billion people into a room, a physical room. You can cram 10,000 people into a room, and if, if you can cram 10,000 people into a room, you bet they're going to pay you to speak, right? You were even 30 people or 50 people or 100 people, okay? Um, uh, the other thing that's not infinitely scalable is um, uh, people's generosity. Okay, this is interesting. So after this video, I can say, hey, if you found this video to be helpful, will you mind tipping me a dollar? Because if, if a thousand people watch this video and everyone tip me a dollar, I'll have a thousand dollars from this video. Um, a dollar, a dollar is, um, you know, uh, I, I should, I should say it's, it's not, it's not, it's, it's scalable. Um, it's, it's actually infinitely scalable too. But it's, it's kind of turning it around. If everyone just contributed ten cents and I had a million people watch this video, this video would be worth a lot to me. Right? So that's an example. But um, so I hope that helps give you some ideas there. Uh, Donna asks. Best, what are some best suggestions for starting a motivational speaking career and wanting to package my Why History Matters ideas into a template that can be applied by individuals and companies? So, again, um, there are basically two paths here that I want to share real brief. One path is what I've been teaching for four years, which is when you give away free information, give away strategic information, give away information that makes people want more. Um, again, most of my peers are teaching this. This is nothing new. Um, I, I no longer want to teach this because I, I, I feel like that's inciting desire within people. I'm, I'm like learning a lot from Buddhism these days. I no longer want to incite desire. The, I, the, iron, the irony is I'm in the marketing industry and all the marketing teachers, even the conscious ones, say you bring people on a journey. You bring people into their pain and then into their pleasure. You know, the ideal from pain island to pleasure island and then try to close the gap. Well, that's basically inciting desire within people. Buddhists, you know, you know, the Buddhist uh, um, philosophy would say that that's, you know, we're we're kind of taking people backwards because we're we're making people want something that they might probably don't even need. Okay, so um, you know, this is Buddhism. You bring Buddhism into it, it throws marketing into it, totally for a loop here. But um, but so there's two paths, right? There's one path which is giving strategic information that makes people want more information, and therefore you you give a you give a package away, and that's either um, the package could be a webinar package, it could be a you know a coaching program package where they get some access to you through question and answer sessions and information, etc. So that's one path. I've taught that for four years. I feel like I'm done teaching that. You know, um, you can. Uh, what I'm going to start doing uh, in the coming year, for those who still want to, to know more about that, I'll start to promote some of my colleagues who are teaching that path really, really well. Um, so that's how I'm going to make money, uh, basically. I still have an email list of 18,000, so even though I'm giving away every, all my information for free, I'm still going to make money by advertising because I'll be emailing my audience and say, hey, this is an advertisement. Um, if you want to learn this particular path, I no longer teach it or I don't teach it, and you should buy from this person. And when you buy from this person, I, by the way, I vouch for this course that teaches this idea very well. Uh, if you like this idea, you might want to consider it. And if you buy it, then I earn a commission for having advertised this to you. So I'm going to be honest with my advertising from now on. In the past, we haven't, you know, people like me haven't been honest with their advertising. We ask you to join our list, and we start emailing you things from our friends and our colleagues are doing this free webinar. Our colleagues are giving away this free video, but it's, it's call it what it is. It's advertising, paid advertising. is basically what it is, um, paid by commissions, right? So, um, so that's one path. The other path is one that I'm trying to figure out. So, Donna, you know, I'm I'm very much in this uh, in this uh, in this. How do we market compassion? How do we build a compassionate business where we give away everything that can be scalable? And I'm not new to this. Again, bloggers have been doing this for about a decade. They've been giving away all the information for free, and then they sell something that's truly scarce. Well, the ones some of them do. Some of them sell more information, but sell something that's truly scarce, which is, Donna, once you build an audience of people who look to you for your webinars, your YouTube videos, your blogs about, um, about why history matters, then companies, organizations will say, Donna, can you come speak at our conference? Can we pay you to speak? Or Donna, can we have you consult on how do we figure out history within our company? 
our company is starting to lose track, or organization is starting to lose track of, of how to track, keep track of history. So that's an example. Um, uh, so one of the things that I'm going to be talking about going forward is how then do we market our free information, right? Because if the compassion and marketing platform is about infinitely scaling our free information and therefore having an audience that would then make a lot of sense to want to pay us for what's truly scarce, our time, our, cons our consulting, our coaching, our in-person presence, then how do we market inf that information? And I've already posted some things about this and I will be continuing to post. I mean, I, you can follow me on Facebook, on um, you know, YouTube here on uh, on on um, Google Plus. I keep posting information like this, but I'll keep I'll, I'm going to keep on trying to to hone the a more simple uh, and um, sort of step by step formula, a body of work about how do we market information in a compassionate way uh, to really scale our free information consumption more quickly than what bloggers have typically done. So that's what's going to be coming up. Um, thank you for that question. So let's see here. Um, so yeah, no, a really great question, and this is this is regarding the whole spiritual business, spiritual marketing idea. Is are we when we now? I'm totally saying something that's controversial, right? Because I'm not saying I figured it out also, but I'm sensing into something that needs to be addressed, right? Which is the, the, the question of, are we inciting desire within people when we market and get them to want to buy? Or are we addressing their true needs? Well, I think that's an open question, and I'm not saying I have an answer to that, but I invite us to go into that in inquiry. Um, and it's 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 sort of like the way I think about it right now. And again, I, this is not the final answer. So this this inquiry continues. The way I think about it right now is, if I am able to give away as much information and help as possible. Now remember, we're not giving everything away. I'm not spending you know twelve hours a day answering emails for free from people or posting for free and going to. That is not a wise stewarding of our livelihood. Okay, but we give away that which can be given away. So, so what I do though is I, as I take maybe a, a little bit of time every day, maybe half an hour a day, to give my time for free, to go to certain places to answer questions for free. So you see, I give my time for free, but in a very wise and st that my time is scarce. So I give away my scarce things away for free in a way. That um, where I can feel like I'm being generous, I'm helping whomever is seeking help. So that includes people who email me, and you know the time I do spend on email a day. I don't see. I used to think, gosh, I'm going to only help the influencers for free, but now I'm practicing helping anyone who needs help for free, because I feel like that's a higher way. Um, helping only influencers for free is a more strategic way, a more way of the world, and I guess it will, yes, it will bring you more sales, but it doesn't feel good to me. It doesn't feel good to my soul. So I'm trying a higher way of just helping anyone free, but doing it in a limited slice of time, which of course means that you need to be good at managing your time, <laughs> which is something that I really believe in, managing your time, being aware of your time, because, because not managing one's time is another way to be self-indulgent, right? Because the internet is just another way of comfort food. There's another comfort food. So being, being, being self-disciplined is another way of working hard, is working at the stuff that matters, which is being self-disciplined, working at virtue, and therefore giving away our time, that which is scarce, in a, um, in a limited way, right? Um, and, give, and yet trying in, in our other time, that's where we're being generous, to produce generosity in as infinitely scalable ways possible. And when I do that, what I believe and what I've seen is that people who want more, I'm not trying to get them, so here's a key, I'm not trying to get them to want more. But I think it's very natural that if they want more of me or they want more clarifications and it's outside of the limited time that I can give away for free, they'll say, can I pay you for it? Then it's a question that they will naturally ask. Otherwise, how will they get more of me? They can't, 
right? So that's um, that's sort of my my one answer for now, and this inquiry will continue. How do we market compassionately in a way that actually people will end up buying from us, but we are, aren't inciting desire and going the whole pain pleasure island thing, closing the gap, all that stuff, opening the gap and then closing it. and then opening the gap. I really, it's in my opinion, inciting desire. How can we do it compassionately for their soul that we don't incite desire? So somehow, magically, it still creates sales. So I'm going to be, uh, that's an inquiry. I, I would love your thoughts on that. And with that, I'm going to kind of close off the call. It's been an hour speaking of good time management. And for you, too, I want to manage your time, help you manage your time. So, um, all right. Uh, yes, oh, Denise, yes, brilliant, brilliant. Um, uh, distinction there, Denise, between outbound marketing, inbound marketing. Yes, Denise, uh, you're absolutely right. Inbound marketing. Those, please Google this, everyone. Google inbound marketing because that is basically um, something that I'm studying as well, which is another uh, body of work that's trying to get to compassionate marketing. But they're not calling it compassionate marketing; they're calling it inbound marketing. So, um, uh, all right. So with that. Um, I'm going to say goodbye to you. Um, please feel free to keep commenting, uh, those who are watching this live. Those who are watching this as a replay, um, you can comment as well. I don't know if people who have commented are notified about new comments, but um, I will certainly be notified uh, if you comment and you're watching this replay. And in my limited time, I will uh, do my best to respond there too. Questions, comments are totally welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, for for gifting me with your presence and your time because um, otherwise I'd be just talking to myself. I truly hope that this has been helpful for you. Most importantly, I hope that you take away some inspiration from this and, and not only inspiration, I hope you'll take away just even one piece of information that you can apply this week. So think about that. Look through all the comments that have been coming through and, and what is one idea that you can get from all the comments that have been coming through and anything I've said and apply it this week. Apply it this week. Apply it today. Okay, think about how you can apply it today. And I would love it if you can come back to this video and comment to say, hey, I applied this one idea, and this is what I experienced as a result. This is what I learned um, as a result. So thank you again, and I wish you a day forward that is truly filled with awareness and understanding that you are eternally safe. You are truly safe and you will always be truly safe. So with that, be fearless, like this book says, I don't even see, be fearless. All right, signing off, thank you. Thank you all for all of your comments. I can't wait to read them. And um, I'll talk to you next time. Bye for now.